Rocky Peak, Michael here. So good to be with you. It's crazy. You know, last time we were together last week and we lost, uh, lost power and uh, ended up teaching from my uh, upstairs office. It was in the dark as well. We had to bring in light generators and uh, some of you just reached out and said how you actually really enjoyed that. Felt like I was doing a one-on-one Bible study with something, but we're back here in our worship center again. And it's just so good to be with you. Now, before we, uh, we go into our study, uh, I've got one important announcement. If you look at your, your program, you look at the uh, kind of the announcement sheets there, uh, that we have a very important event coming up in a couple weeks. So two weeks from this weekend, the last Sunday of the year, January the 31st, we're doing a very important encounter service. Now, uh, if you're new to Rocky Peak, an encounter service is a time of focused prayer and worship, some vision casting as we kind of seek the Lord at the beginning of a, this new year for what he has. Thank him for what he's done this past year, how he's sustained us, and we kind of seek his blessing, his direction for this new year. So I'm really excited about that. But what's a special about this is this is going to be the first time that we're going to be inviting you back indoors on campus. So we're not ready to announce like regular weekend services yet indoors. We're still praying about that. Thank you, by the way, for all your help with the surveys. It's been extremely helpful. We're still seeking the Lord, but we really feel called to, uh, to kick off the new year with an encounter here indoors. Now, if you would love to be part of encounter, but you say, hey, I'm not ready for whatever reason to come indoors, we've got you covered. So we're going to be doing at least one of the services, uh, one of the services that evening uh, online as well. Just like a weekend service, we'll also have the patio opened up. We'll be streaming the service out there in the patio if you want to come on campus, but you're more comfortable out, uh, outdoors. You'll have all the options. Now, what we're going to do, because we want to make sure that we have enough room, because these, uh, these services, the uh, indoor service is going to be very COVID friendly, right? We're going to we're going to be doing social distancing. We've got kind of pods of chairs around the worship center. You can sit with your, your family or whatever. Uh, we're going to be wearing masks and all that. And so we, we, uh, we want to make sure we have room. So what we're actually doing is we've decided kind of like a Christmas uh, Eve or something, we're going to have multiple services. We're going to have a, a one service at 5 o'clock that Sunday, one at 7 o'clock. And what we're going to ask you to do is to register online or on your app simply so that we know how many people are coming so that that when it's full, we can say, hey, this one is closed. We don't want to compromise our distancing. We want to reopen in a way that's just safe and makes you feel comfortable. Uh, the other thing I wanted to let you know is that, uh, you know, one of the things we do at the encounter, the last 10 minutes, we just take a, a real kind of quick time for a, a congregational meeting. What we do is we introduce the elder candidates. Uh, we uh, take a quick vote on the budget. And so in preparation for that, uh, I sent you a letter a couple weeks ago with our proposed budget uh, and our elder slate. And so if you have any questions about the budget, any questions about elders, any questions about our directions as a church or why we're we're doing what we're doing. Uh, we encourage you to come uh, every every year, two weeks for the two weekends before we do the encounter service. We have a Q and A session, and we're going to be doing that uh, this weekend and next weekend after our, our Sunday service on campus. Uh, we're going to be doing that on the uh, on the patio outside the worship center. All right. So if you if you want to come for that, you can do that. So anyway, we're really excited to be coming back to campus and kicking off the year with just really seeking the Lord, uh, thanking Him for what He's done this past year, the way he sustained us, uh, and then seeking his direction and his blessing for this year. So hope you can join, whether it's online or in person or outdoors, I hope you can find, uh, make that a priority. There's a church we can come together and seek him together. All right, so we are going to go into a time of teaching, and as Dre just mentioned, you're definitely going to need your note sheet today, and so if you haven't kind of downloaded, be sure you, you do that, and then I'm going to pray and we're going to jump in. So let's, let's pray together. Well, Father, we're just so thankful to be here, and we thank you for that we have power this weekend, and it's just great to be together. Lord, whether we're uh, gathering uh, in a home with some friends, whether with, with uh, family, whether we're kind of on a, a boat or a picnic table, uh, in the back room, the front room, the living room, wherever we are, that we are gathered together as one people underneath your leadership. And so, Lord, we just thank you for the way you work by the power of your Holy Spirit, that though we're physically distant still, that spiritually we're connected. And so we pray that you would be speaking now by the power of your spirit. I pray you'd give me the words to say uh, that you would unfold your word. I think of Psalm 119, the unfolding of your word gives light. And we pray that you would unfold your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Well, our story starts today in a, in a back room, and uh, they've all been 
Uh, they've all been called in. Each person in this room has been carefully selected. And, uh, and so they're now sitting at a, at a large, long table, sitting around a table. And uh, honestly, they're kind of a mixture, of a little bit bored and a little bit nervous to see what's about to happen. And all of a sudden, the door to the room opens. And they're told that their time has come. So they get up and one by one, single file, outside the door, they're gonna take a left, go down a short hallway, it's kind of dark, out into a large room. And once they're there, they're gonna be seated. And once again, they begin to wait. And as they're waiting, you can feel the tension in the room. You can feel them looking around the room, taking in their surroundings, wondering what's about to happen and how long is it going to take. And finally it happens. A different door opens and their journey begins. Well, today we are continuing this new series that we started last week called Signs, The Path to Life. And uh, if you're new, I wanna welcome you. And uh, what we're doing in this series is we're, we're taking a, a kind of up close and personal, in-depth look at the life and teaching of Jesus as seen through the eyes of one of his uh, closest followers and friends, uh, a man we call the Apostle John. And what John is doing in turn is he's taking us on a journey um, through the life and teaching of Jesus, um, and especially focusing on seven of these signs or supernatural works of power that Jesus performs that kind of reveals who he is, why he's come, and lead us to life. And so today we're actually, for the first time, gonna open up the book uh, in chapter one and kick it off, and we're gonna look at the first 14 verses of the first 18 verses which make up the, the intro or what scholars call the prologue to the Gospel of John. So if you have your Bibles, you have your apps, let's go ahead and open up, turn on to John chapter one and we'll pick it up there, verse one. But before we do, before we jump in, I wanna set the stage uh, and help us understand like what John is doing in this intro, how he's structured this Gospel so we can better understand what's happening. So uh, to, un to explain this, let me, uh, let, me, let me go back and let's talk about the story we started the day with. You know, today we started the day with the story of this group of people who are sitting in a back room around a, a large table. It's a Tuesday. And uh, they've been assembled there, carefully selected for a very important task. All of a sudden the door opens, they're going in, they go to this larger room, and now they're waiting longer until finally this next door opens. And this is a, a true story from my life. Um, when Lynn and I were living in San Diego many years ago, that uh, I was selected, uh, surprisingly, to be on a, a jury, to be part of a jury for a federal drug running case at the, at the courthouse, federal courthouse in San Diego. And uh, on top of that, I was even further surprised that once we got into the jury room, uh, that the jury ended up selecting me to be the foreman. And it was a fascinating experience. Um, and I'll never forget um, sitting in that back room around this table, being waited to be called in. For most of us, it was the first time we'd been on a journey, may, maybe all of us. And then finally, at the time comes, you, walk, you, you get up, you walk down that short hallway into this large courtroom, take your seats in the jury box, and you began to survey the room. You see the defense attorney, you see the defendant, you see the prosecuting attorney, you see other court reporters, everything is set. And then all of a sudden comes that moment when the door opens and the judge enters and the bailiff says, will you all rise? And then all of a sudden the sense of the gravity and responsibility of what you've been called to do begins to fall upon you as well as just a gratitude to be in a country like this where you have a jury by your peers. But one of the things I remember about that trial, and the reason I bring it up now, is that one of the first things that happened is that the judge turned to both the prosecuting attorney and the defense attorney, and he asked them to make their opening statements. And so what they did is that they got up, and in a sense, they told you the end of the story before they'd started the beginning of the story. They told, they introduced you to this client or this defendant. They told you a story of what had happened. They told you a story of why he was guilty or why he was innocent. And so in a sense, they told you where this trial was going from their point of view. Now, during this 
introdu- this opening statement, they weren't introducing evidence. That's going to come later. They were just making a case, telling you the story. They were giving you the conclusion that they want you to come to based on the evidence that they were about to present. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul, uh, John is doing in the intro to this gospel. In the intro to this gospel, like, a, like an attorney, he's, he's introducing us to Jesus. And he's making some amazing claims. He's telling us what he's going to show, what he's going to prove. Why Jesus has come, what happened when he came. He's standing back and giving you the big picture story. He's telling you the ending at the beginning. And after he finishes... Then he'll go on from the middle of chapter one all the way through chapter 20, giving the evidence that has led him to his conclusion and hopefully leads you to the same conclusion. And so with that as an intro, let's take our Bibles and jump in to chapter one uh, of, uh, of John. Chapter one and verse one. So John starts off and he says, in the beginning was the word. Now notice that that, word is capitalized, this is a a person. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now this is interesting. John is obviously playing off of Genesis 1.1. Do you remember how the opening verse of the Bible starts? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And John says, that's true, but there's more to the story about this God. And he says, in the beginning, you can kind of push back the beginning as far as you want. You go back before time and space, before creation. But when you get there, whatever you, as far back as you want it, when you get to the beginning, you're going to meet a person. And he tells us two important things about this person. He tells us, first of all, that this person is with God. In other words, this person is distinct from God. But secondly, he tells us that in some mysterious way that this person, though he's with God, is also God himself. And then he's gonna tell us a third thing about this word. Uh, So he says in verse two, he was with God in the beginning, and now here comes the third thing. He says, through him, all things were made. So remember back in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but there's more to the story. Well, he says, through this word, all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. One thing we're gonna see in John is that he loves to state, state, make a statement from the positive and then turn it around and make it from the negative to clarify the point. And he says, in the second part, what, what he literally says in the Greek is without him, not one thing was made. Not one single thing in this incredible cosmos. Not one molecule that moves was made apart from this word. And it's interesting because if you remember back in Genesis 1 where God creates the heavens and the earth and he says, let there be light and there's light. How did God create? He created by speaking. And now we're told that he actually, this word is what created, is the one who created. And he goes on, he says, in him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. We're gonna see throughout the gospel of John, throughout the teaching of Jesus, this unique relationship between life and light. And what we're gonna see is the light stands for all that's good and right and true. The darkness stands for all that's evil, all that's defiled, all that's destructive, all that's wrong. And we're gonna see in John that there's a battle between the light and the darkness. In fact, the darkness is going to put this word to death. And so he goes on and says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. It appeared to overcome it, but it didn't overcome it. And now John is going to do a little sidebar for us. Before he tells us more about this word, he wants to do a sidebar about the first witness that he's gonna put on the witness stand to testify in regard to this word, his true identity. And this witness is a man named John. We know him as John the Baptist. And so he says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. 
And he came as a witness, notice that court language, to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe in the identity of the word. He himself was not the light, but he came as a witness. Again, court language, witness to the light. Now he tells us something new about this word that was with God, that was God, that created the world, who's the, who gives life to all things, is the light of the world. He says that this true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Now this is interesting. Because the word in your Bible, and it says, in the beginning was the word. The word that John uses there is a very important word, both for Greeks and Jews. It's the Greek word logos, and it has huge connotations. It's hard to capture it in a single word, like the word. But it's interesting, for example, if you were a Greek or Roman philosopher at the time, probably the most important probably the most famous, uh, most popular Roman philosophy at the time from Greco-Roman is what we called Stoicism. Stoics believed that they looked at the world uh, as if it was the body. They looked at the physical universe as if it was a body and they believed that there was a world spirit that animated the body that brought order and beauty to the world. And guess what they called this world spirit? the reason, the, the mind behind the physical reality. They called it the Lagos. And it's interesting because in the Old Testament for Jews, in the Old Testament, uh, the Bible often talks about the wisdom of God in a very kind of, they, the wisdom of God like in Proverbs 9 is, is personified that she was there daily at his side. But the, the word of God is often personified in the Old Testament that God spoke and his word accomplished what he, he, he sent it to do as if it's a person. And so for both Jews and Greeks up to this point in the gospel where he said that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, for both Jews and Greeks, this would sound somewhat familiar but what he's telling us, what he says next is going to be incredible, audacious, something completely new. And he says in verse nine, he says, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. What John is claiming is that there's a, there's a time and a place when this word who is with God, was God, created the world, it's the source of all life, is the light of the world. There's a time and a place where this world entered into creation to become part of the human race. And so he says, and when he, when he did, it did not go well. He said he was in the world and the world was made through him. The creator had come. But he said the world did not recognize him, both in the sense of uh, he came sort of incognito, but also in the sense they didn't want to recognize his authority. The darkness didn't want to recognize the authority of the light. Verse 11, he came to that which was his own, his own creation, um, his own people even, the people of the nation of Israel, but his own did not receive him. They didn't receive him as their king, as their God. But there was a minority response. And he says, yet to those who did receive them, he gave them the right, the authority, the power to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent. Uh, John says, I'm not talking about a human birth here. Not of a human decision, not of a husband's will, but born of God. And of course, we'll learn more about this in chapter three from Jesus when he, he says to this top level religious leader, you must be born again if you're gonna enter in the kingdom. And then he tells us more about this word coming in, into his world. He says the word became flesh. He became a human being. And we're gonna see that in John, that he was a real human being. He wasn't just uh, like God in a bod. You know, he wasn't just like Clark Kent pretending to be human when he's really Superman, that he's, he's really human. He has limitations. He gets tired. He gets thirsty. We're gonna see this over and over. He says he became flesh and he made his dwelling amongst us. 
And in the Greek, what it literally says is he tabernacled amongst us. Like God built a tabernacle to, his, to live with the nation of Israel uh, in the wilderness when they came out of Egypt. And we'll talk more about that next week. Very powerful analogy. Hey, so we, he said he made his dwelling amongst us and we have seen his glory. Do you remember when the tabernacle was built and finished, how the glory of God filled it? He's continuing that, that analogy. We've seen his glory the glory as of the one and only Son. Now, catch this. Let, let's say that you are living in Ephesus. It's 100 AD. This is where the Gospel of John was written about 10 years ago. You have grown up as you're a, you're a follower of the God uh, 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 you know, uh, Mithras. You are maybe a Stoic philosopher and and all of a sudden, you've, you've come across this new sect called Christianity. You know nothing about it. Um, and someone says, well, here is uh, the story of his life, the life and teaching of their leader. His name is Jesus. And this was written by an eyewitness, one of his closest friends. With, they call him the Apostle John. Why don't you read this and learn about what Christianity teaches? Well, what will we know by this point if all we had was the Gospel of John and knew nothing about Christianity, well, we would know that Christians believe that if you go back to the beginning of time, there was a person. He was a person they call the Word, that he was with God, so separate, and yet God himself, who was a creator of all things, gave life to everything, is the light of the world, and at a certain time that he came into human history. You don't know his name yet. Have you noticed that? Jesus has not been mentioned. Christ has not been mentioned. He's only been called the word. He's been called the light, but nothing else. But here we learn something else about this word who is with God and was God. We learn that he was the son of this God. And this will become very important that when John talks about the Son of God, he's talking about the Word who is with God and who was God. He's also the Son of God. And so he said, the Word became flesh. He made his dwelling. He tabernacled amongst us. We've seen his glory like in the tabernacle of old, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And we'll talk more about that next week. But I want to stop there today because there's so much here. There's so much to unpack. I just want to stop, take a couple weeks to break down this prologue, this intro to John, to set us up for where we're going in this whole series. And what I want to do today, and the time that we have left, is just ask a very simple question for you. It's a question I'll be asking you throughout this series. It's a very important question. It seems simple, but it's powerful. It's profound. And it's there in your note sheet. There's a section called signs, the claims. And, and here's the question. How big is your Jesus? How big is your Jesus? What I want you to catch is as we enter into this, this prologue, this intro to John, as John stands back from his life of being a disciple of Jesus, um, all he experienced, him teaching, uh, his miracles, his life, his, his resurrection, um, and he's reflected on that over the course of his life, and now he's an old man writing the story of Jesus, that the core claim he is making is absolutely incredible. And here's the way I summarize the intro to John, this will make even more sense next week. But this is the way I summarize it. That John says there was a time and a place when the God who created all time and all space entered into his creation, became a part of the human race to reveal himself and to give us life. Now that is an incredible claim. And I want you to see this. I want to go back and just hit three passages we just looked at again quickly to see how clearly John makes this claim. In verse one, there in your note sheet, in the beginning was the word, the logos. 
And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now, throughout history, there have been those who have tried to follow Jesus without that claim. Uh, if you are a Mormon, you cannot say that. You do not believe that. You believe that Jesus was a created being. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, you don't believe that. If you're a Muslim, you don't believe that. If you're a Hindu, you don't believe that. John is making an incredible claim. It's an audacious claim that goes to the heart of Christianity. That there was a time and place when the God who created all time and space entered into creation, became a part of the human race to reveal himself and to give us life. You go on, his second claim. In the next verse, through him all things were made and without him not a single thing. So this word who is with God and who was God is the creator of the universe. He was the agent of creation that there is nothing in this cosmos that's billions of light years long that, that is not made by him. There's not a single molecule that moves. He is the absolute creator of all there is. And then the third claim, the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. There was a time, a specific time in first century Israel in the backwaters of the nation when the God who created all time and space, the creator came and was born of a young Jewish woman, supernaturally, as the other gospels tell us, to become part of, our, a part of the creation that he created to rescue us. Now this is an amazing claim. And I wish at times you and I could go back before we'd heard anything about Jesus and hear it for the first time and hear how audacious it is. One of my favorite authors, I'll mention a couple times today, is the, the, the British uh, professor, uh, Cambridge and Oxford, C.S. Lewis. And you know, Lewis came to Christ later in life. He was an agnostic. And he went on to write so many popular books like Chronicles of Narnia, but also so many um, def uh, books in defense, brilliant books in defense of the Christian message. And his most famous book is called Mere Christianity. In other words, core Christianity. Not all the secondary issues, but one of the primary issues that define who Christians are and what they believe. And in that book, he talks about this claim that Jesus made that we're going to see throughout the Gospel of John that he makes in different ways throughout all the Gospels to be the Son of God in John's sense, God in the flesh. And this is what Lewis writes in Mere Christianity. He says, then, came, then comes the real shock. Among these Jews, there suddenly turns up a man who goes about talking as if he was God. He claims to forgive sins. Now catch this. This is not like me forgiving you of a sin. Like you do something to hurt me and then I say, I forgive you. This is not that. This is you hurting someone else and me on the outside saying, I forgive you for that. Who has the right to do that? Only God has the right to, to forgive sins in that sense. He says that he's always existed. He says he's come to judge the world at the end of time and we'll, we'll see that. We'll see many more examples of that in John's gospel. He says, now let's get this clear. Among pantheists, and of course pantheists would be uh, those who believe that, that the whole universe is God. You're God, I'm God, we're all God. Uh, the famous, really, uh, you see a lot like in Hinduism in, in India, also in the New Age movement. But he said among pantheism, like India's, he's talking about Hindus, uh, anyone might say that he was a part of God, you know, because we're all part of God. Or one, might, uh, or, or one with God. There'd be nothing very odd about that. I'm one with God. You, know, you hear that in New Age teaching. He said, but this man, since he was a Jew, could not mean that kind of God. God in their language meant the being outside the world who had made it and was infinitely different from anything else. And when you've grasped that, you will see that what this man has said, quite simply, the most shocking thing that has ever been uttered by human lips. 
And by the way, this is why Lewis goes on in mere Christianity to say this is why it makes no sense to call Jesus just a great, uh, a great uh, teacher or a great moral leader. Great teachers don't claim to be God. He goes on to say that with the claims that Jesus made, he didn't really leave us very many options. He's either a liar, uh, someone who knows he's lying about being God and he's just manipulating us, or he's a lunatic, he's crazy, he's out of his mind, or he's Lord, not many options. I like what Philip Yancey, another great book called The, the Jesus I Never Knew. Philip Yancey, uh, a, a great author, he says, uh, Jesus' audacious claims, and I love that word, I think it's a good word, his audacious claims about himself pose what may be the central problem of all history, the dividing point between Christianity and all other religions. Although Muslims and increasingly Jews respect Jesus as a great teacher and a prophet, no Muslim can imagine Muhammad claiming to be Allah any more than a Jew can imagine Moses claiming to be Yahweh. That would be crazy. Likewise, Hindus believe in many incarnations, but not one incarnation, while Buddhists have no categories in which to conceive of a sovereign God becoming a human being. But this is the claim that we're going to see Jesus is making. This is the claim that John is making. And this is the claim that's going to get Jesus killed. And in the rest of the gospel, John's telling us where this story is going. In the rest of the gospel, we're going to see why John came to that conclusion as Jesus teaches this and then backs it up with these supernatural signs over and over again. And so throughout this series, we're going to be coming back to this question, how big is your Jesus? When you think of Jesus, who is Jesus to you? And this is such an important question, not just theologically, not just so we have orthodox doctrine, not just so we don't fall into a cult, but this is immensely practical. And the reason is simple, is that the bigger your Jesus the smaller your problems. The greater your Jesus, the greater your peace. You know, I mentioned C.S. Lewis uh, being one of my favorite authors, and of course he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. And one of those chronicles, the one that's Prince Caspian, there's a, a beautiful scene where Lucy, who's one of the, the youngest of the four children that get magically transported from 1940s England into this kingdom of Narnia. She is returning to Narnia in this book. On a, she, she's been there before. And one of those beautiful scenes in the book is when she gets to see Aslan, the great, the, the great king. And uh, Aslan, Aslan, of course, is, is a lion. He's the great king over Narnia. Uh, and uh, he's sort of a Christ figure. And when she sees Aslan, she's so excited to see him but she's also blown away because he's so much bigger than the last time she was in Narnia. And so she says to him, Aslan, you're bigger. And Aslan says, no, that's because you are older, little one. Every year you grow older, you will find me bigger. And such a beautiful statement as followers of Jesus if we want to respond to the challenges we face as we grow ever older, that we, we have to leave the Sunday school Jesus behind. Not that it was wrong in any way, but we have to leave, whether it's the flannel graph or the cartoon Jesus, the small images that, we've, that we often carry about in our mind, that that Jesus is not big enough to handle the level of problems that we face in our life. The bigger he is, the smaller our problems become. Now let me ask you a question. What is the biggest challenge you're facing in your life right now? Is it this whole situation with, with COVID that's just driving you crazy? Is it, the, is it your own health or the health of a loved one? Is it something happening in your marriage or with your children? Is it something in your dating life? Is there a sin in your life that you just can't seem to master? Is there an addiction you can't overcome? Is there a relationship you can't fix? 
Are you struggling with your finances? What is the biggest challenge you're facing right now? See, the bigger our Jesus, the smaller our problems. I don't know about you, but for me, if I'm honest right now, one of the biggest challenges in my life right now is what's going on in our country, in our culture. It's, uh, I'm a person, I live in the future, and I'm a big picture thinker, and I see implications down the road. And when I, when I see what's happening in our culture, when I see what's happening, whether it's politically, spiritually, morally, ethically, um, it is often so depressing to me um, because I see where this road is going. I've been seeing this for years and now I'm seeing it happen in front of my eyes. And it's very discouraging at times. You know, this weekend, I was reading in the Wall Street Journal. One of the first things this new administration has done is they're working to introduce a bill in Congress that would be a federal bill that would uh, protect a woman's right to have an abortion. So that even if Roe versus Wade in 1973, the Supreme Court turned that over and made abortion, they, they could, it wouldn't stop it because there'd be a federal legislation for all the states for a woman's right to abort her child. And I, I look at that and I say, God, where is this country going? What is happening to us that we would kill our own children and defend that right as a top agenda of an administration? But it goes on and on, right? It, I, I think of this, this movement in our culture to redefine human sexuality, to redefine gender. I look at the way it's becoming propaganda, being put, forced on our kids in school. I, I look at the loss of religious freedom. I look at the inability even to debate issues, the loss of ability to think critically in our culture. I look at the level of division in our culture right now. I look at the rise of censor, censorship, and I wonder, where am I living? How is this happening? I look at the influence of critical race theory and how it's tearing our country apart in so many ways. Instead of building bridges, dividing us more and more. And I tell you, there are times when it becomes a heavy load. And can I tell you something? At times like that, Jesus always has to take me back to reorient me. He has to reorient me. Who I am, who, more importantly, he is, who is my king? Who is Jesus? You see, a flannel graph Jesus is not big enough to handle the problems you face, whether it's the problems in your personal life or our national life or our culture or our global life. We need the word who is with God, the word who is God, the word who's the creator of the universe, the word who darkness tried to overcome and will never, fail, and will never accomplish that. The world that, that conquered death itself is preparing the future for us. Like the Lord has to constantly take me back, remind me who he is and remind me who I am and then I'm good to go. This world is not my home. He's with us. He has not abandoned us. He will empower us. He will lead us. He will guide us so we can be stars in a dark universe. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Later on in John, we're gonna see a great example of this. The disciples are gonna be completely bummed out. They're gonna be super depressed. Jesus has just told them that he's leaving. He's just told them if the world hates me, they're gonna hate you. They're gonna come after you. And they are depressed. This is the night he's about to be arrested. And the next day he's going to be crucified. And they're very discouraged. And here's what Jesus says there in your note sheet. In John 16, he said, I've told you these things. What things? That I'm going to prepare a place for you. That I will come back for you. That in the meantime, I will send my Holy Spirit to lead and guide and protect you. Yes, the world will hate you. Don't let that bother you. It hated me first. He said, the reason I've told you these things 
is so that in me, you may have peace. Not in the culture, not in the circumstances, not in a proposed future, but in me. He said, in this world, you will have what? Trouble. He said, that's what, that's what it's gonna be. But he said, but take heart. This world doesn't have the last word. I have overcome the world. How big is your Jesus? We are living in difficult times and we're gonna need a bigger Jesus if we are going to listen and follow him into our future and thrive whatever the future brings. And so the question I will keep asking you over and over again in this series is how big is your Jesus? Because the bigger your Jesus, the smaller your problems. The greater your Jesus, the greater your peace. Let's pray together. Father, we're just so thankful for the beauty of your word that reorients us and is constantly pulling back the, the curtains to let us see the reality. That you have come, you've conquered death, that you are returning, you live in us, you'll empower us to move into the future, you will give us everything we need to thrive. And that we can have peace, not in our situation, not in our circumstances, not in our culture, our peace is in you. Because you are the word, the word that was with God, the word that is God the word that has come into our lives to give us life. And so Lord, we pray as we celebrate that today, you'd open the eyes of our heart that you would grow bigger and that every year you would grow bigger as we grow older. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.